Chapter Two of the Story of Geronimo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Story of Geronimo by Jim Gelgard. Chapter Two. Raiding the Papagos. Three days later, at sunrise, an excited Geronimo sat nervously on his mother's aging stallion and waited for the raiders to start. Besides Delgatito, who was the leader, and Geronimo, there were four braves named Najizi, Sanchez, Tacon, and Chii. The dome-shaped wickiups where the villagers lived were softly beautiful in the early morning light. Here and there the embers of the last night's cooking fire, for in this fine spring weather the Apaches did most of their cooking out of doors, glowed like a star fallen to earth. But except for the sentries who had been up all night and the raiders about to set forth, the village slept. When all the raiders were mounted, Najizi and Sanchez left the others. Presently they returned driving a dozen loose horses, among which was a beautiful spotted Appaloosa. This horse had belonged to a shaman or medicine man of the White Mountain Apaches and had been taken from him in a night raid. It was always necessary to have extra horses when going into enemy country for any reason they could serve as remounts. If there was no other food that could be eaten or that could be traded, if there were any opportunities for trading. But Geronimo wondered why Najizi and Sanchez had included the Appaloosa. The spotted horse was famous throughout the land. Even the Papagos and Pueblo-dwelling Zuni knew him, and whoever saw him would surely send winged words to the shaman. Then a war party from the White Mountain Apaches will come to rescue their medicine man's horse, Geronimo thought. But he asked no questions. Surely Delgadito knew what he was doing. Najizi and Sanchez drove the loose horses on at a full gallop, for the sooner the animals were tired, the sooner they would be willing to stay with the rest, and the less trouble they would cause. The other raiders rode out from the village more slowly. An hour later they overtook Najizi and Sanchez, and the driven horses, now too tired to run. They fell in at the rear and seemed satisfied to stay there. Geronimo felt a rising anxiety. He had always imagined raiding to be a stealthy business. These men laughed, shouted, and gaily mimicked a coyote that moaned from a nearby ridge. Presently lithe, slim Tacone challenged fat Chii to a race whooping at the top of their voices they were off geronimo stopped worrying delgadito was too experienced a raider to do anything foolish if he let the warriors act as though they were no enemies within twenty miles then there were none that night they camped on the top of a rocky hill from which they could see in all directions and they were careful to put all fires out as soon as darkness fell Fire may be seen for a long distance on a dark night, Geronimo said to himself. That is why they were put out. The next morning the raiders rode on, and not until mid-afternoon did they make the slightest attempt to hide themselves. But when they finally halted under a cloud-ridden sky, there was a change in every man. This was desert country, and they stopped in a cluster of rocky hills. Delgadito and Chii dismounted and climbed the tallest hill to scout from its summit. Soon they returned and told the others to dismount too. Tethered ropes were slipped about the necks of the loose horses, which were now led by the raiders, 
as all went on quietly. A half hour later the raiders made a second stop in a dry wash. The banks of this desert creek bed were about four feet high and rimmed by cactus and palo verde trees. Sanchez and Delgadito felled one of these trees with copper hatchets, cut off two stout chunks, and tied either end of a long rawhide thong to them. Then they stretched the thong as far as it would reach and buried the chunks in the earth. At the bottom of the creek bed, careful to place a gentle horse between two quick-tempered mounts, they tied all animals to this picket line. This done, all got their weapons and started up over the wash. Geronimo ran happily for his own bow and arrows and followed. Suddenly, Delgadito turned, put a palm of his hand against the youngster's face, and pushed so hard that Geronimo found himself seated in the bottom of the wash. Stay here to watch the horses, the chief growled. But I am a warrior too, Geronimo protested. Delgadito growled again and amused smiles flitted over the lips of the others. The raiders melted into the desert. Flames of anger scorched Geronimo's cheeks, and rage ate at his heart. He had a fierce desire to pursue and kill Delgadito in revenge for being knocked down. But he knew that he must obey his chief and he found it much more satisfactory to be guarding warriors' horses than to be playing children's games in the village. Geronimo pillowed his back against a boulder, and for a while never took his eyes from the horses. Then it began to seem foolish to watch them at all. The animals were standing quietly, and the idea that an enemy might come into the creek bed seemed unlikely. Presently, Geronimo went to sleep. Some time later, he awakened. At first, he thought he had been disturbed by the deepening clouds and a feeling that rain would soon fall. Then he peered down the wash. Two nearly naked Indians carrying war clubs were stalking the horses and were only about forty yards from the nearest animal. Their clubs, the way they wore their straight black hair, and their tattooed faces stamped them as papagos. It was plain to see that they intended to steal the horses. When he was certain that neither papago was looking in his direction, Geronimo slung his quiver of arrows over his back. Taking his bow in hand, he crawled swiftly to and under the nearest horse. The horses were not in an even line, but all stood perfectly still because they were interested in the papagos, and their legs formed a rough tunnel. Geronimo crawled down it. Reaching the last horse, he stopped and licked dry lips. He wished Delgadito or any of the others were there. It was one thing to dream of becoming a warrior and quite another to face the enemy. What should he do now? Then the papagos saw him, raised their clubs, and rushed forward, and there was only one thing he could do. Geronimo plucked an arrow from his quiver, notched it, drew his bow, took careful aim at the nearest papago, and shot. The papago was hit squarely in the heart. The only sound as the man fell was a jarring thud when he struck the ground. His companion turned to run. Forgetting to notch another arrow, Geronimo crawled weakly from beneath the horse and for a few minutes sat shivering. Then he remembered that, though he was still a boy, he would soon be not just a warrior, but an Apache warrior. Forcing himself to rise, he walked over to look at the dead Papago and told himself that he was glad he had put an end to another enemy of the Apache but he was just as happy that he had not killed the second papago too. Before long, a black horse, flanked by a gray and four bays, jumped down into the wash, ran across it, and stopped. They stared back in the direction from which they had come, 
and the tethered horses raised their heads to stare too. Geronimo thought that the black was a wonderful stallion and was surely stolen from some Mexican rancheria because no papagos bred horses so fine. Now more horses came galloping over the desert until there was a herd of about eighty milling around the wash. For the most part they were scrawny papago ponies, but Geronimo saw one more fine stallion, a dark gray with black spots. Riding stolen ponies, which they guided without help of saddle or bridle, Delgadito and his raiders were on the heels of the last horses. As their mounts jumped into the wash, they slid off. Delgadito made his way to Geronimo and looked down at the dead Papago. How is this? the chief asked. He would have stolen our horses, Geronimo replied. Was he alone? There was another, the boy admitted. I did not kill him. You should have, Delgadito scolded. But come now and mount. Geronimo ran with him to the picket line and mounted his mother's old stallion. Then he was astounded to see Delgadito take time to strip saddle and bridle from his own horse and put them on the Appaloosa. Geronimo marveled. This was enemy country and when the Papagos discovered that some of their horses had been stolen, they were sure to launch a hot pursuit. But Delgadito seemed as calm as he had ever been at home in his own wickiup. Mounting the Appaloosa and whooping at the top of his voice, Delgadito charged the herd. The other riders took off, one after another, and drove the horses full speed straight north. This puzzled Geronimo. Finally, he rode over to talk with Nadizi. Why do we go north, he asked. Our home is almost due east. Worry not and question not, Nadizi said coolly. Look and learn. Always at full gallop, Delgadito was racing from one end of the line to the other. The Appaloosa already had run at least six times the distance any other horses had traveled. About an hour and a half later, Delgadito caught his own horse and transferred saddle and bridle from the Appaloosa to him. The exhausted Appaloosa staggered ten feet to stand, with head drooping. Geronimo finally understood. Beyond any doubt, Papago trackers were already on the trail of Delgadito's Membrino raiders. They could not fail to find the weary Appaloosa, and they would know its owner was the shaman of the White Mountain Apaches. They would also see that the stolen horses had been started northward, toward the home of these Apaches. Thus the Papagos would think that they had been raided by men from the White Mountain tribe, and they would seek revenge on them rather than on the Membrino Apaches. We have a wise chief, thought Geronimo, as Delgadito's plan became clear to him. Just then, Delgadito said, Chee, continue northward with thirty of the more worthless horses. Leave a plain trail as though we were stricken with panic, but drive the horses back and forth so it will appear as though there were many more than thirty. Run as soon as you see pursuers. Chi nodded, and the rest of the men started dividing the remaining horses into smaller groups. Why do we do this? Geronimo asked, riding along beside Nadizi. It is easier to hide the trail of a small group of horses, said Nadizi, and the Papagos will find it much more difficult to track us since we will take each herd in a different direction before swinging back to our village. Do I drive some? You are too anxious, stripling. Nadizi was far more respectful since Geronimo had slain the Papago. You will ride with one of us. Suddenly the rain clouds which 
Geronimo had noticed earlier loosed an earth-battering torrent. The raiders smiled. Usan, god of their tribe, had indeed blessed them, though the Papago trackers would certainly find the Appaloosa. They would never discover where the rest of the horses had gone after a storm such as this one. Driving all the horses ahead of them through the pouring rain, the raiders turned homeward. In the bright sunlight next day, the stolen Papago horses cropped grass on the slope opposite Delgadito's wickiup. Geronimo listened anxiously while Delgadito, as was the right of a chief who led a raiding party, divided the plunder. The leader reserved twenty horses for himself, and the twenty he chose included the two fine stallions. Then he gave smaller numbers of horses to the four men who had gone with him. The number each received depended on how hard he had worked to make the raid successful. Next came a just share for all families who had no one to steal horses for them. Geronimo's heart sank as the horses were given away. He had hoped to get something for himself, but now the only horses remaining were a dozen or so fit only for the cooking pot. Delgadito declared them as such. Then he announced, so that all could hear, I give part of my portion, the black stallion and the gray stallion with the black spots. He swung to Geronimo, to an Apache youth who deserves them because during this raid he behaved like a warrior. For a moment, Geronimo was too surprised and delighted to move. Then he tilted his head, squared his shoulders, and went proudly forth to claim his prizes. End of chapter 2